Welcome to the PI World webinar on Thursday, 16th of April 2020. I'm your host, Tamsin Freeman. Today we're joined by Jamie Streeter, also known as at Compound Income on Twitter, who will outline his investment strategy and how he's navigating the COVID-19 markets. Jamie is going to give a presentation and it's titled Investing, Compounding and Surviving the Corona Crash. And then there'll be time for questions at the end. Jamie, thanks so much for joining us today. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Tamsin, and uh, thank you to everyone on the call for taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, listen in today. Uh, I hope you'll find it useful. Just to start off, you've probably never heard of me, so I thought I'd start with a quick introduction um, in terms of who I am and what my evolution as an investor has been over 35 years of investing. I'll then go on to look at sort of why I compound income and uh, my philosophy that goes with that and portfolio construction that comes out of that for me and how, how that works for me. Uh, next, after that, I'll show you about how I find investments that sort of fit in with that philosophy and process and help go towards that portfolio construction. And then finally, um, give my emphasis on income, I'll look at the outlook for dividends and the market post the corona crash and how hopefully I'm surviving that. I'm conscious that I've got a lot of slides to get through, so I'm not sort of going to go through this line by line, but you know, the detail is there. Um, in essence, you know, I spent 24 years as an investment professional across various firms, managing lots of different funds. And then for the last 11 years, I've been investing independently, um, having left full-time employment uh, back in 2009. So, I mean, that's the headline summary. As I say, um, I'm conscious we've got a lot of uh, detail to get through. So uh, let's get cracking. My evolution as an investor within that sort of 35-year career, if you like, um, I suppose I started out as a value stroke growth at a reasonable price investor. Um, and so back then I used to look at things like PE and yield relatives and you know, always looking for those that were cheaper than market but growing faster than the market and therefore you could look forward to re-rating and say that subsequently became known as growth at a reasonable price uh, along the way. I've always been attracted to income investing and I've come to appreciate sort of quality along the way um, in terms of, sort of balance sheets and trying to buy decent companies. Uh, it's a bit sort of motherhood and apple pie, I suppose. But um, really, it's important to think about protecting the downside as well. So we've always been wary of leverage or gearing, uh, not getting into too heavily indebted companies. Um, after all, in this game, uh, a lot of the battle or half of the battle is sort of avoiding losers as well as just picking winners. So uh, and sometimes people might lose sight of that. I've also learned to embrace uh, momentum factors along the way, especially um, estimate revisions. Um, although as a value investor at heart, I've always struggled with price momentum as it seems to sort of conflict with uh, looking for good companies that might be beaten up after underperforming. Um, it also goes against the whole idea of buying low and selling high, but uh, given the behavioral biases at play, it, it does seem to work. So as I've come to uh, accept that and uh, the main place that that's really helped me, I suppose, is um, avoiding value traps because if you're a value investor, it's often easy to say, oh, well, this looks great. I'll, I'll have some of that. But you know, actually, there's other stuff going on. And uh, you know, if you ignore those estimate revisions and the price momentum, you can get badly sort of caught out. So I think you know, that's, a, that's a big lesson I've learned along the way. And that's something that's really helped me. Um, also, uh, as things have developed, obviously, when I started out, we used to you know, do handwritten notes and calculate all the um, ratios ourselves. Um, since then, technology has developed and I've embraced quantitative techniques and I still use those uh, to this day, as, as you'll see later on. And also, I think the private investors are so much better served these days with the internet, access to information and lots of great services out there. So, um, yeah, a good time to be investing and obviously lots of changes over 35 years. And basically, you never stop learning in this business. So uh, let's look at uh, those 35 years and see if there's any lessons we can learn. I hope you can see this chart on on the top there, but basically that's showing the S&P total return index over pretty much that sort of time frame. It goes back to just pre the 1987 crash, which you can just see as the first sort of sell off there on the left hand side. And then there's lots of other events over that 35 years as, as I make reference to there. Um, yeah, there was a savings and loan crisis not long after the 87 crash. Um, various other things along the way, LTCM crisis, which I'm not sure is actually on this slide, and, and the Russian debt crisis in the late 90s. Um, that was something that, uh, you know, 
comes along and you have all these worries and crises as they're sort of suggested at the time. But when you look back at the chart here, you can see that yeah, they hardly show up. And I suppose, you know, um, I'm saying that yeah, whilst this is a pretty unique situation we're in at the moment, we've, we've been through things like this in the past. So it's, it's not that unusual. Um, I mentioned there on the slide about uh, the Greenspan put being minted in 1987. So obviously they came in slashed rates uh, when the market crashed and that seemed to do the trick back then. Um, they didn't do it so much in the, the early 90s thereafter. There was a bit of a recession in the early 90s. Um, but it's really in the late 90s that, um, you know, I, I felt this sort of got going and has sort of snowballed since then because it seemed as though, oh, there was going to be a big sort of reset and you know, sort of think, well, that should be kind of an Austrian sort of economic theory. I'll let things sort of go down, let debt sort of be written off, weak companies go by by the wayside and then um, the whole thing resets. But they they were very keen to sort of not let that happen in the late 90s and they pumped in sort of liquidity and cut rates when this uh, LTCM, which was a hedge fund at the time that got into trouble by, you know, um, they were messing around in the bond markets and it went against them, but they, they got bailed out. So, um, or they bailed out the markets to help them anyway. And then ever since then, every time there's been a downturn, so in the um, post dot com crisis and then of course even more so in 2008 2009 although they did sort of experiment with i think lehman's go bust and then they sort of realized well that probably wasn't the thing to do because it might collapse the whole financial system they really sort of came in big time and then this time around i think they've learned from that and you know almost as soon as this crisis hit the market you know it's gone from being at a peak to falling within a couple of weeks, they've they've come out all guns blazing and literally thrown everything at the market. So um, increasing amounts and sort of more moral hazard each time. So there we go. I think we're going to have a poll at this this point just to see um, how people are feeling about all that because obviously the market has um, you know recovered quite nicely given all that money that's been thrown at it. So uh, I think there was a survey last week when Stephen English was on, but. Uh, just thought we'd do a quick update um, to see how people feel about that. And I think uh, Tamsin's just put the uh, questions up on the screen there. Did you want to uh, go through that, Tamsin? Yes. Yeah, so based on the history that we've just gone through, today, are you bullish that we've already hit the low, neutral that we'll retest the low, bearish we'll see a new low, or confused or don't know? And if you could answer that now i'm sure you've run through this a million times in your mind so you'll be quite quick at responding to this okay should we give the results of these votes so we've got 44 okay. percent are neutral and we might retest the low and 36 percent are bearish with 15 percent confused and just five percent who are bullish that we've already hit the low all right, well, let's uh, crack on to the next uh, part of the presentation. That takes me on to um, you know, why do I compound income? Um, if you look at the chart on the right, uh, that's something that attracted me to making income part of my process very early on. I, I remember um, the equity guilt studies that BZW used to do back in the day then, but it's now become the sort of credit Suisse guide. And we'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, now, I know some people say, oh, well, yeah, but it's not really about the dividends. It's all about capital gains. But in reality, it's a bit of both because um, you have the dividend and you have retained earnings within the company. And then those are sort of compounding up together once you reinvest the dividend. And um, it certainly pays to reinvest and compound the income if you can. And on the left hand side there, it's just an indication that it also pays to start early if you can. And that's just showing that um, if you'd started uh, investing £5,000 annually and achieved a fairly modest 5% growth rate on that per year, how much you could end up with um, at the end of time and how much less you'd have if you started 10 years later. Um, for me, you know, I started out um, when PEPs were around in the early 90s. Uh, I was able to put about 6,000 in each year at that time. And also back then you used to get dividend tax credits, uh, which could be reclaimed. Um, so it made sense to me to target higher yielding stocks in a, in a PEP and then what became ISAs thereafter. Um, which is what I've done over the years, uh, put more than uh, sort of 5,000 a year in constantly as the uh, allowances increased. And uh, fortunately, I've made a bit more than 5% a year as well. So uh, there we go. So this is just to say that uh, obviously since 2009, it's um, been even more important to, to think about compounding your income. Because if you look at the chart on, on the left, 
um, back in the 2000s. This is showing um, interest rates and what you could have earned on sort of savings deposits versus the inflation rate. And also back in the 90s as well, it was possible to get a, a real yield off of cash deposits. Hey, remember that? Yeah, that was great. Um, but since 2009, we've had this sort of financial repression going on. So governments have brought interest rates down to sort of record lows and bond yields have kept on tumbling and been brought down and held down by quantitative easing and, and other things like that. So um, against that background, if you, if you try to sort of um, live off of investments, it's become even more necessary to take a risk with your money and people have been forced into uh, stock market-based investments. Indeed, back in 2009, it was possible to pick up sort of four to six percent net yields quite easily. But of course, you have to be prepared to bear the capital risk. And you know, I think uh, we've had a pretty good 11-year period um, post that of sort of a not quite a constant bull market but a, a pretty good run and obviously just now people are rediscovering the uh, the downside of the volatility that come can come with equity investing so um the chart on the right is just a simplistic sort of inflation thing if you have two percent a year inflation that quickly eats away at your money so um you know i think obviously compounding your income is, is a good way to try and uh, tackle that so uh Let's have a look at the, the long-term picture on the next slide and see see how that uh, how that pans out. And this is coming from that uh, Credit Suisse Global Investment Returns Yearbook that I sort of referenced uh, at the beginning. Here in the longer term, it's interesting to note over sort of 120 years and 50 years, equities offered the greatest returns. But both bonds and cash actually over that period have been okay. So as I say, remember this is real returns. So this is after the effects of inflation that we were looking at on the, on the previous slide. And it reflects that the UK has also been um, quite an international market along the way and, and done quite well over that longer term period. But um, so if you're looking at um, on the bottom section in 1900s to 2019 and 70s to 2019, actually the UK did better than uh, global equities. And everyone always says, oh, well, UK's rubbish and do you, do you need to invest overseas? Well, that's not necessarily always been the case, but certainly in the last 20 years, yeah, global equities have done better than the UK. I think there's an element of which, uh, you know, that it's where technology has come into play much more in that period. Obviously, the US and elsewhere are much bigger in that. And UK has got a bit stuck in in sort of old industries like oil and uh, banks and, and other things. So um, that's worth noting. Also, the other thing, bonds uh, have nearly kept up with equities over 50 years, which would probably be quite unusual. But that's really reflecting the, the sort of 40 year or so bull market we've had in bonds as yields have just kept on coming down and down and down and particularly in you know the last 20 years that means bonds have actually outperformed equities again which is somewhat different to uh, the long-term history um, but with bond yields being so low now i'd certainly probably expect ac ac equities to outperform from here um, certainly given all the fed support uh, along the way money printing and possible inflation ahead um, unless, of course, we end up in a deflationary depression, despite all those efforts of the central banks, in which case bonds and uh, cash would probably be um, a better place to be. But uh, obviously, time will tell on all of that. Uh, so what's my investment philosophy against uh, that background and where we find ourselves today? What I'm looking to do is grow my capital and income in real terms over time. And as we just saw on the previous slide, and where we are today and where we were in 2009, I sort of feel that uh, equities are, are the place to do that. Um, although I should say, as you could see from my career at the outset, I, I've been an equity man or I'm an equity man, so I'm probably biased in, in that respect. Um, and equally, I've probably only invested in a fairly favorable period of time. So who knows what the future holds, but you know, looking at history, you know, I think that is still the place to be. I say, unless, of course, we end up in some sort of deflationary depression, in which case we're probably all doomed. But um, how do I go about that? Well, I, I look primarily in the UK because I'm a UK investor. My liabilities are all in the UK. So um, I know people go on about home bias, but uh, you know, I don't really have a problem with that. Um, and also, the, as we saw, international sort of makeup of the UK market means it's not necessarily as uh, domestically focused as you might think. Um, so I tend to ignore zero payers, blue sky, future hope type stocks or lottery tickets, uh, if, if you like, and exclude those from the universe of uh, stocks that I'm looking at. Also generally avoid um, EMP and mining stocks um, as you know, I don't really feel I have a, 
an edge or a strong feel for those. Um, then the other important point at the bottom there is I use closed end funds for diversification of asset classes and income sources. So that'll be where I'm getting um, you know, international exposure from there over and above that that comes from the stocks themselves and also broadening out my income sources uh, in addition to the UK equities I'm buying. Again, getting income from other asset classes or around the world. So uh, uh, let's see how that uh, feeds into my portfolio construction on the next slide. I use sort of a core and satellite or silo approach, if you like. So um, I have ISA portfolios, um, which in common with the scores portfolio that I run on the, on the website is run with 20 to 30 stocks. So I'm looking there for um, slightly more active uh, investing and uh, monitoring and um, looking to grow that sort of pretty well and compounding that up. Outside of that, I've got other longer term accounts, as I described, and where I'm looking to uh, for a growing income generation, if, if you like. Um, and uh, I use closed end funds in, in there too. Um, that's pretty important. That's something I'll sort of come back to in a minute when we talk about dividends. Um, VCTs are also providing me with a tax-free income, which I built those up when I was working, and they're now sort of uh, doing that job for me. Um, again, uh, in 2009, those did see their dividends coming down a bit, so I guess we could see that again this time around, um, although they've got some uh, disposals and things that they can probably pay out from in the short term, but there have been some regulatory changes recently, so again, they, they might sort of edge their dividends down a bit there. Um, then finally, just as prudential financial planning would normally recommend three to six months um, cash in reserve to cover your expenses, I like to, to go beyond that and have at least a year's worth uh, in, in reserve to cover you know, fluctuations in investment income and emergencies, et cetera. Um, but overall, you know, it's a very diversified portfolio. I know people say you should be very focused and, and have um, you know very focused portfolio, which I do to a certain extent in, in my ISAs where I've got that sort of 25, 30 stock portfolios, which I think works pretty well for, for that type of investing. But um, when I was setting out to you know earn my living, if you like, from investing, I wanted to go for not max, but as much diversification as I could in terms of the assets and the, the holdings that I've got. Because the UK markets, as you know, you could you could buy a tracker, but that suffers from the concentration of income from the the, the top stocks, um, like the the oil companies and the pharmaceuticals and the banks, and we've all seen the the problems with that over the years. So, I've got about ninety eight holdings across all of that piece that we've just looked at there, which I know some people probably whoa, what the hell, but that split fifty fifty between direct holdings and closed end funds. Uh, and that includes the venture capital portfolio as well. Um, by value, that would probably be about 60%, 40%. Uh, so 60 direct, 40% in in closed end funds. Basically, it avoids too large exposure to, to any one position and also too much of my income coming from any one position. Um, I guess the current corona crisis is a, a real-time test of that theory. So um, we'll see how that, that goes. Um, obviously, the Closed end funds, investment trusts, I do really like those as we're finding out today or in these current times. Yeah, there's lots of unexpected dividend cuts out there. I should probably say that these dividend cuts we're seeing um, are pretty exceptional. Um, I have a bit more to say about the outlook for dividends in a moment. But you know, what I like about investment trusts is that they have the ability to uh, maintain or build up reserves, which they can then dip into to, to maintain their dividends. And they can also um, pay from capital reserves as well. So, uh, you know, I think that gives me quite a lot of uh, reassurance that my income probably shouldn't be too badly hit uh, through all of this. But nevertheless, I'm probably still looking at some reductions, but I'll, I'll sort of touch on that uh, as we go through the next few slides or a bit later on. Next slide is how do I find suitable candidates for looking at and further research? As I mentioned already, I do this sort of compound income scoring system which I'll, I'll give you a sort of worked example of that in, in a moment. I do share that via my website, which people can sign up for um, for a very modest fee if, if they're interested. But um, yeah, I think most people like to do their own thing and, and do things their own way. But uh, you know, it, it's out there and um, information is on the website if people are interested. Um, although I'd probably just caution that, you know, obviously at the moment, uh, no company can really forecast. So you need to take all numbers with a bit of... Um, with a bit of care at, at the minute. So um, obviously there are plenty of other well-known investment solutions out there, software solutions, which I'm sure most people 
listening to this are probably familiar with, plus publicly available information. I'm sure most of that's not any different to what uh, most people do or use. So let's go on now just to look at the compound income scores and, and how they work. What I thought I'd do here is just take a, a couple of well-known large stocks and we're looking here at some sort of conventional valuation metrics like PE, yield, price to book, price to sales, you know, classic value measures. And you can see here Vodafone versus Unilever on those, those traditional measures. Vodafone comes out pretty much on top on, on all of those factors. And I thought just for a bit of fun, we'd just do a very quick poll here um, just to see, okay, looking at those metrics, thinking about the stocks, which one, uh, which one would you choose? So I think uh, there we go. The, the box is up there on the screen for you. Uh, as I say, obviously Vodafone, um, mobile phone provider, Everyone's using their phones at the moment to keep in touch with people, probably calling people a lot more. So, and obviously the networks are still working, so they're probably still running okay, doing a right out of all this. Unilever, equally, people still got to eat, get their cleaning stuff. Um, so again, you could think both of those would be um, not too badly affected by the current corona crisis. Um, I mean, don't overthink, you know, which one, just think which one, okay, on where we are today and based on those value metrics, well, do you think would be good? I'm not, I'm not trying to catch anybody out. It's not not a trick question. It's just you know a bit of fun, really. And then I go on to show you how I look at uh, these stocks with the compound income scores. Great. Well, I think okay. we've got Tamsin, the. I don't know how we're yeah, doing there. I think we've got the answers now. Sixty three percent go for Unilever, and thirty seven percent go for Vodafone. All right. If we go on from those uh, value metrics to looking at how things are. Um, looked at in the, the uh, compound income scores. I should mention here that the higher the score, the better in, in this case. So on the value score within the compound income scores, um, they actually come out about even here, whereas you saw on the previous slide that Vodafone was um, coming out better on traditional measures. So that's because I use also an enterprise-based valuation, so that's taking debt into account. And um, Vodafone, as you'll see on the way through, has a lot of debt, so that drags down their value score on that basis. Yield, it's better because that's the other thing I look at is yield in, in that sort of value score. So they're coming out about even on, on that basis. Cover, there's not a lot to uh, choose between the two, although um, Vodafone would have worse earnings cover. I also take free cash flow cover into account and Vodafone is a bit better on that measure. So it actually comes out slightly better on cover on that basis. Where it does fall down though is if you get into dividend growth. Um, here I'm looking at the sort of history of dividend growth and the forecast dividend growth as you're probably where Vodafone's cut its dividend along the way recently. Unilever's been a fairly steady payer. So um, Unilever ends up in the top quartile on that basis and Vodafone is in the bottom quartile. Financial security, this is coming back to the leverage point I made at the outset. Um, so here this is looking at the balance sheet debt interest cover, that type of thing, and, and how that's moving. So again, it's a top quartile, bottom quartile uh, split. And the same thing with operational quality, where I'm looking at uh, you know, how good a business is it. So, you know, the classic sort of compounding thing you want to be doing is looking for a business that's got good operating margins, good returns on capital, so it can generate decent profits, earnings, and cash flow. And that's going to help to underpin your dividend and pay that dividend to you in the future. So... Again, Unilever's winning out on that score. Estimate revisions, I say that's the sort of momentum factor I'm looking at here. Not a lot to choose between these two. They're both slightly worse than the average within the universe of stocks that I'm looking at. Um, but, you know, it's useful to keep an eye on that because it can just highlight if you know, the trends are improving or deteriorating. So overall, that gets um, put into, you know, rescored and re-ranked, if you like, and... Um, Again, within that uh, dividend-paying universe of UK stocks, Vodafone's coming out nearly in the bottom decile, but certainly bottom quarter. Unilever is towards the, the top quarter. Now, it's not necessarily a recommendation to rush out and buy Unilever, but obviously you're a shrewd bunch because more people uh, came out uh, in favour of Unilever. But you know, if you pick Vodafone, don't worry about it. You know, it, it, It's a market of stocks, and you know, for every buyer, there has to be a seller and vice versa. Um, I have held both of them myself along the way, but uh, I did sell out of Vodafone a few years back when it was around 200p as I became concerned about you know, the dividend prospects and thought there'd probably be a dividend cut coming through Unilever. I've held for four or five years and that, over that time it's gone from about £30 to £40. 
I mean, obviously, we don't know what the future holds. Some people are concerned that um, you know, it might not last. But let's just have a look at those uh, metrics on the next slide that have gone into those scores that we just looked at. Um, I mentioned the enterprise value based uh, EBIT to enterprise value yield. So that's effectively like sort of equating. So you can compare everything across the, across the piece and it would be akin to what you can get from a, um, from a bank account, if you like, or an interest rate. Um, dividend growth, yeah, Unilever's better. Uh, interest cover, again, that's the balance sheet coming through. And uh, pretty point nine is pretty low, to be honest. I'd probably look for more like three times there. But obviously, Vodafone, it's quite a stable utility type business. So, you know, maybe that's acceptable. And a lot of their income is uh, RPI linked these days as well. But then, you know, the, the um, operational metrics, again, at the bottom, um, you know, pretty poor in the case of uh, Vodafone, but pretty good in the case of Unilever, although obviously not guaranteed that will always be the case going forward. But um, if we just look at a bit of history on the next slide, um, on the right-hand side there, you can see Unilever has made pretty consistent um, return on capital. That's the green bars um, across the piece and with the axis on the right-hand side. And then its margins, they've done a great job actually of you know, ramping their margins up over the years with a few blips along the way. But you know, again, you might sort of worry a little bit, well, have they sort of gone as far as they can on that or might that come down? In the case of Vodafone, um, you know, that's... Uh, was a great business pre-99, but then they went a bit nuts and bought management and uh, then had to invest in the next generation sort of uh, stuff. So, you know, the returns then uh, were not not that great going forward, and especially after they then sold Verizon off in, in the US uh, down the line. Next slide. Um, so, okay, the winner could be Unilever on the way I look at things, and certainly it's provided better returns o over time, but, uh, you know, uh, you pay your money and take your choice in this game. So let, let's crack on from there now to the uh, to the next stage. So how has it been for me since 2009? Um, the top graph on the right-hand side there is just how my ISA has done over that period. So uh, it's about 10% per annum. It was 14% at the end of 2019, but obviously the recent sell-off has hurt that a bit. It's better than the market, so I'm happy with that. My overall income has gone up by about 4 to 5% per annum. Um, the RPI over that period has compounded as about 3%. So quite happy that I've managed to achieve my objective so far of um, you know, growing my capital income in real terms. Who knows what the future holds? Um, compound income scores, that's a portfolio that I launched five years ago when when I developed the scores just to really see um, how efficient they were at picking stocks. And I've been running this portfolio based on a top quartile of compound income scores since then. And uh, that's done okay in the last five years quite a bit better than the market. And actually, when I checked in a blog recently, it actually outperformed about 98% of similar UK funds. So it seems to work. Um, quite pleased with that. But, you know, uh, that's, again, history, really. And we've, we've got to go forward from here. So thinking of that on, on the next slide, what is the outlook uh, for dividends post the corona crash? Well, um, I wrote recently that I'm expecting a 30 to 50% reduction potentially in payouts this year. And we've already seen a lot of those coming through in suspensions. And we don't know quite how quickly some of those are going to come back. That's really based on uh, long-term history and also futures markets for the US and Europe, which are sort of indicating cuts in, in that sort of region. And also Link Asset Services, who do the dividend monitor, they've also recently put out an update. And they're suggesting we could see about a one-third fall in in UK equity dividends. Uh, that's if the oil majors manage to maintain their dividends, which Royal Dutch Shell seem to be showing some appetite for doing that. Um, but if they don't, then they were saying it could be sort of up to a halving or slightly worse, so about 50% off of uh, UK dividends uh, in the current year. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, somewhere in that, that sort of range is probably what you should be expecting from the market as a whole. Obviously, your own individual um, situations will differ for myself, I was saying, hoping that my experience will be slightly better than that. So yeah, probably guessing maybe somewhere 20 to 30 percent down at, at worst, hopefully. Um, but as yet, I haven't actually seen too many reductions coming through, a few suspensions here and there. But um, again, time will tell on that. Um, we should see a bounce back thereafter. Um, and once things get back to some sort of normality, but you know, I fear it might take a bit longer in t than 2010. Um, given all the, the bailouts and a bigger recession that uh, people are expecting now, and also the fact that corporates might want to uh, rebuild their balance sheets. 
and maybe run with more conservative balance sheets, um, perhaps, who knows. But uh, also I note in the US, um, companies that are getting help are going to be precluded from paying dividends and making share buybacks, which doesn't seem unreasonable, I suppose. And also I saw a news story yesterday saying sources were reporting the EU are considering something similar. Uh, I'm not aware, you know, if that's been explicitly stated in the UK or um, if they're going to do that. But, you know, I guess it must be a risk and you know, probably not unreasonable if, if the state's bailing people out. It, we certainly saw that with the banks in 2009, that they didn't pay dividends for quite a few years after that. So, um, you know, I guess that's a risk as to why things may not bounce back uh, that rapidly. So on the next slide, we're just taking a look at that. So um, could be a longer road back this time, I'm saying, really. So if you look at the, the, the top graph there, now that's just somebody's, you know, hypothetical example of how the economic recovery could play out. Um, I suspect it could be sort of some kind of tick shape like they're showing there, but could morph into a W if, say, a vaccine's not forthcoming and uh, more outbreaks are seen along the way. Plus, also, in terms of the economy, I'm not sure that things will necessarily bounce straight back to where they were. Um, I think people will be more cautious. Um, there might still be some distancing measures in place when things restart. It's anyone's guess, quite frankly, as to what goes on. But I'd probably be less optimistic about a a V-shaped recovery than than some people might be, and certainly as the stock market seems to be. The bottom chart, I'm not sure how easily you can see that, but basically that's um, some futures projections in the US market as to how they see dividends recovering over there. Um, and you can basically, if, if you can't actually make up the numbers, but it's essentially suggesting that it's going to take quite a few years to get back to where we were um, at the end of last year, as opposed to 2009-10, when it only took probably a a year or two to get back up to the same levels and beyond. So um, again, you know, some difficulties there um, in, in terms of the bounce back might take longer this time around, I suspect. Well, that's the economic and sort of dividend background. What about the stock market from here? So let's let's get on to that. Was We had the vote at the beginning and people seem to be a little bit cautious. Um, this is your typical sort of market cycle of greed and fear. Now, in terms of, you know, people get euphoric at the top and then a bit of anxiety and then you get some fear and denial as, as you come down. I think we were sort of probably been in that phase, but obviously we've had this big rally, which is made up about 50% of, of the falls that we saw. So, you know, maybe people are in denial on that basis. I don't know, but, um, you know, we'll have to see see how that works out. So let's um, go and see what that looks like uh, in terms of real world evidence. Um, in terms of the S&P here, we've had this what I term as a sort of dead cat bounce, um, or is it off to the races again? You know, people seem to be being pretty bullish and there's a few bulls out there in terms of the survey. So um, it, it bounced off of kind of the median PE level. Um, it's rallied back up, as I say, recovered about 50% of, of the falls that, that it saw from the top, probably getting in towards uh, that sort of band of resistance there you know, shown in orange at the, at the top of the chart. I think we've just seen it sort of coming off in the last day or two. Some commentators I, I follow quite closely, they're, they're talking about, you know, better value being around about um, the sort of 2000 level on on uh, the S&P. And, and if things overshoot, you could see that going down to maybe the 1700, 1800 level, at which point it would probably be a, a good good buying opportunity for, for longer term returns. Because as ever, you know, you, the returns that you get are dictated by the, the, the price that you pay at, at, at the outset. So uh, obviously... Um, We'll have to see how the market goes from there. Well, what, what about the um, you know, longer term picture on that? Um, again, probably feels like it's too soon to call the bottom on the US market. Just looking at this history here of bull markets and bear markets uh, going back to the 1960s. I mean, there's only really the 1987 crash, uh, which turned around in, in fairly short order of about three months. So unless this is going to sort of replicate that, uh, you'd probably normally expect you know, the bear market to drag on for a little bit longer than this. And particularly in terms of uh, bear markets associated with recessions, um, we've generally seen worse drawdowns in, in that scenario. So in the last two, we, we saw drawdowns of close to, to 50%. Um, and given the IMF and others are saying this looks like being worse than 2009 and maybe even as bad as the 1929 depression, um, that would tend to suggest, based on history, that... Uh, there could well be some more downside to come. Uh, looking at um, the UK market on, on the next slide, uh, again, just reiterating the point here, um, recessions tend to lead to worse drawdowns. 
um, FTSE chart here. You can see the last two times, again, we had those sort of 50% down, down drafts. Um, again, we did about 30 at the worst, and we've had a bit of a rally since then. So again, suggesting there could be more downside. Um, having said that, you know, valuations are getting relatively low. Um, on the left-hand side, you've got the P of the all share index, um, I say approaching bear market lows back in sort of 2009, 10, it, it did get sub 10 times, which is sort of a you know, fairly classic, uh, level to, to think about bottoming out in, in a bear market. And obviously you'd probably expect the P to start spiking upwards fairly soon as we see all the, the. Uh, downgrades coming through. On the right-hand side, you've got the uh, the FTSE dividend yield. Uh, obviously, that spiked up massively because people are expecting and we're seeing all these dividend cuts. But it's interesting just to eyeball that and notice that since sort of about 2010, that's largely ranged in sort of 3.5% to 4.5% uh, range as, as to where um, the market has uh, wanted to um, find support or resistance, if you like. Okay, so that's the... the um, Valuation. So the next next slide is just some technical stuff. Now, sorry, the first one is a bit of a mess on the left hand side. So it's something I, I got off of Twitter actually, but it's got some long term trends drawn on there. Which you know, I'm not a technical analyst myself, but I think you know, there's something to to these. Sometimes you get economies growing at a certain rate, so the market can probably sustain a certain rate of rise. And quite interesting, there's quite a collection of uh, you know red support lines running up there at the bottom, in between about four thousand five hundred and 5,000. So yeah, we bounced off about 5,000, which is the, the top one of those. So um, yeah, maybe that will provide support again if we do see another sell-off or perhaps it might extend a little bit further. I don't know, time will tell. On the right-hand side is a slightly less messy chart. That's um, again showing the longer-term trend in, in FTSE. It sort of found some support in that sort of mid-range level around about 5,000 as we know. Um, but slightly alarmingly, obviously the last two downturns um, went below 4,000 to about 3,700. Seems to have some sort of magnetic attraction to that level. So one hopes we're not returning there again. But again, you know, given the economic outlook, uh, I guess you couldn't rule it out. Um, so that sort of technical and um, economic background. Well, what about sort of valuation measured yield, which is close to my heart? On the next slide, let's uh, take a look at that. Um, this is a FTSE 100 ready reckoner that I've uh, done. So basically, I've Assume the dividend base from the end of January, um, based on where the FTSE was at the top there, as you can see in the um, first row of the, uh, the table. And the yield then was 4.5%. Um, then if you rebase that uh, that dividend or those dividends to either, say, 67% of where they were, so that's the, the one-third cut, uh, which is perhaps you know the best-case scenario coming out of this, and then the worst case, say, a 50% reduction, and then I've imputed, you know, what levels would the FTSE be trading at um, if you use that sort of three and a half to four and a half percent range that uh, reproduced on on the right hand side there again. Um, so at the most optimistic, you could get back up to sixty three hundred maybe, and obviously we were you know, heading towards that uh, sort of well last couple of weeks, but not quite that far. Um, you know, middling middle of the range at 4%, well, you, you get some support coming in around about 5,000, interestingly, that uh, with a one-third reduction in dividends and a 4.5% yield, you know, 4957, that's not far off where we bounced from. So, you know, maybe a, a retest of the low and then perhaps, or maybe even a slightly higher low might be um, possible if, if the dividends shape up in that fashion. However, if, you know, if things cut up really rough and, you know, the old majors end up cutting the dividends and the economy is a lot worse than people expect, doesn't bounce back as quickly, and we do end up with a 50% reduction, then you know, worst case there is spookily, again, 3699. It's that 3,700 figure again. So, um, you know, we'll watch out. You know, maybe we might get back down there again. I hope not, obviously, but, um, you know, time will tell, I suppose. So um, let's just move on from there. So how am I dealing with that and surviving it? Um, Personally, like a lot of other people, I think I underestimated it coming into this, maybe a bit complacent. Um, I did take some action early on to sell some um, some more vulnerable transport-related um, stocks, uh, but I did come into it reasonably well-placed with um, some cash positions and physical gold, so that sort of helped a, a little bit at the margin. Uh, I'm not panicking about the dividend cuts and suspensions, given my cash holdings, and I'd hope and expect that, as I said already, my portfolio may not be as badly affected, but, you know, say maybe 20, 30% reduction in income 
and possibly even capital values um, going forward from here or possibly even worse if we get back down to that 3,700 level. However, it is a market of stocks um, and I'm focusing on stocks and opportunities thrown up by the volatility and therefore perhaps trading a little bit more actively than I would do normally. But uh, I'm certainly not in a rush to reinvest too much cash just yet, given that sort of history and, um, you know, where the market is in, in its sort of um, greed and fear cycle, if you like. Um, okay, so what does the future hold and uh, where I, well, you know, the fix is in again, as it were, the Fed have been uh, ramping up their support and trying to rig the market again, as far as I can tell. And uh, they seem to be prepared to do whatever it takes, as sort of Draghi said a few years back in, in the last Euro crisis. Um, I mean, they've even sort of gone out and bought uh, or buying ETFs in, in high yield bonds, which is quite amazing. I mean, who knows if the next downdraft, perhaps they'll start buying equities. I, I don't know, but um, remains to be seen if they've done enough in the face of, of um, you know, a large and hopefully short-lived recession. But um, the only sort of thing beyond that, people haven't really started to think about the sort of the fiscal side of things. Obviously, there might be some fiscal spending take place. They might try and you know, boost the economies by, by doing more infrastructure spending, but it's not like a post-war situation. I know people have likened it to that, but it's not like a lot of stuff has been destroyed that needs rebuilding, but um, they might try and do something similar, but infrastructure spending on stuff that needs upgrading. Um, but it, you know, it's quite depressing in terms of we've spent about 10 or 11 years trying to get out of uh, you know, a financial, financial hole that we're in, and now this has all taken us back to um, just about the same situation in terms of budget deficits and debt to GDP. So, um, you know, I think there might be some tax rises ahead again to, to try and uh, sort of deal with that. But, you know, maybe they'll fight shy of doing austerity as aggressively as they did before. Um, don't know. You know, the magic money tree seems to have been discovered. So, uh, you know, maybe they'll just keep on printing money. And the effect of that, obviously, it's quite a deflationary um, scenario that we're, we're going through. But, um, you know, you'd think that with all the money printing going on, that at some point that may well lead through to inflation you know, I know that uh, people probably thought that back in 2009, it didn't happen. So, you know, who knows, maybe it won't happen again this time. But, um, you know, I think uh, that's got to be the risk. Um, and on that basis, I think, you know, in the absence of them failing and it turning into a sort of debt, depression, deflation type scenario that, um, you know, equities are probably the, the place to try and protect you against you know, return of inflation and other, other real assets are available, of course. Um, but, you know, can't really see that bonds yielding a half percent or whatever it is and, you know, cash yielding nothing is going to protect you much from inflation um, picking up uh, as it may well do. And even in the last 10 years, it's still gone up 3% a year despite, um, you know, people worrying about deflation and generally perceiving oh, it's not been that bad. Um, so summary and concluding thoughts. Um, compounding has worked for me so far, but the future, of course, may be more challenging uh, and there may be fewer suitable candidates after all this. As I mentioned, obviously, um, some dividends may not come back as quickly as, as they did last time. On the plus side, those that do or are able to pay decent dividends and grow their dividends um, provided, uh, well, they might, might get a re-rating. So that's something perhaps to, to bear in mind. Obviously, inflation, which I touched on there, which you know, I don't actually think will come roaring through straight away. But if it does come back, ultimately, then... Obviously, that can impact upon equity ratings if it gets out of hand or gets too high. So it's not a one-way street for equities and inflation, but they do sort of help you to protect against it. But um, obviously, valuations are pretty low in the UK at the moment anyway. So uh, you know, that's something to worry about another day, I think. Um, very bad economic hit from this. Markets currently seem to be assuming a V-shaped recovery on the back of uh, you know all that the Fed's doing and their sort of whatever-it-takes stance. But I'm not so sure... Um, you know, that it's going to be that easy. Um, but, you know, I'll be looking for opportunities if we do see another sell-off. Um, of course, I might be wrong. It could be, you know, we go racing away again off to the races. You know, I'm not too worried if I am because I've still got plenty of exposures. So uh, there we go. That's really, um, that's where, you know, where I am, how I see things, uh, rightly or wrongly. Obviously, nobody really knows, to be honest, but um, quite happy to take any questions now uh, if, if there are any. Jamie, thank you very much indeed. This is from Phil McFadden. Do you use hmm. specific Stockopedia screens? I do use Stockopedia and um, I've 
view some of their screens. Um, I think there's a few of the income ones that, uh, a couple of them that come out better than, than some of the others. Um, I mean, the problem I find with screening is that, which is sort of why I devised my own sort of compound income scoring system, that um, yeah, sometimes they throw up quite a limited list of stocks. Um, and some, if you look at some of their guru screens as well, that they, they have quite a sort of funny, funny mix of stocks in them, even though it might be quite a sensible strategy that's not always, um, doesn't give you necessarily the sort of stocks you'd expect. Um, and, you know, you, you're probably missing a lot of, of stuff there. So you, you, you can put all your criteria, and the more criteria you put in, the fewer and fewer stocks you end up sort of coming out the end of it. So you, you can potentially miss quite a lot of things there. So um, obviously you can look at their their ranks, you know, across the piece. And, you know, that, that's something that I, I do as well, because if you look at the history of how their ranks have performed, then, you know, you probably want to be focusing on the top sort of two quintiles, you know, scoring 60 and above, or maybe even 50 and above. But as I said, in my presentation on the way through that the biggest thing to try and do in this this game is to avoid the losers and again if you look at the stockopedia um, ranks and you know, probably similar with my own scores you want to be avoiding the the bottom two quintiles really because that's you know where the where the danger lies and where you can sort of get your value traps and um you know, the serial disappointers but not to say you can't buy stocks with those sort of scores or from that part of of the scores if you like that um, can do well obviously there are always stocks that uh, do uh, better or worse than expected but you know that that's my take on it anyway so i do do a bit of screening on there to to answer the question um i say that i think it's the best dividends and um i think there's another one i, I can't recall off the top of my head i think I, in my recent blog i did look at that and how they compared to how this uh, compound income scores portfolio has, has done and um you know, uh, there were a couple of, uh, that came close to to it, which probably seem okay. But as I say, when you actually look at them, they sometimes have a bit of a funny list of, of names. So John Dunn asks, do you invest in small cap stocks for dividend yield or do you just restrict yourself to the FTSE 350 or thereabouts? Right. Uh, no, I, I do invest across the piece. Um, so that universe of um, income paying stocks that I screen for, that's 578 in there at the moment so that goes right through from FTSE down to AIM stocks includes small cap as well so I look across the piece and I will in invest in all those but I mean that's another reason for being very diversified or more diversified so I don't run into liquidity problems so I can still access uh, small caps that way but if I was running a really focused portfolio for the whole of what I've, I'm investing yeah I'd probably wouldn't be able to go go down that far in the uh, income uh, in the market cap scale. So Nyla Shukla asks, are you likely in the environment in the short run to move away from a dividend-based investing to value and quality and take income by selling? Um, no, I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't be selling. I mean, I, I don't sort of um, look to, to take um, income by, by selling. Um, so no, I, I, short answer would be no, but... Um, Obviously, yes, income will be you know, harder to come by or harder to find. But, you know, I think, as I said, uh, I think those companies that, that can still pay their dividends will probably be uh, quite sought after. A follow-up question from Freddie Ahad. Would you ever consider a dividend non-payer if you see it has the potential to do to pay a dividend soon? Yeah, I wouldn't rule it out. But, I mean, it, it wouldn't get picked up in my process as it stands because I specifically exclude zero payers from the stocks I'm screening for. Um, obviously, I might come across a stock that um, you know, is in the market when I'm doing other research or like stock screens elsewhere and might find something. If I was really taken by it, then yes, I, I could buy those, but but I don't tend to, as I say, because quite a lot of them tend to be either be sort of blue sky hope stocks and you know, uh, not earning much money. But obviously, if it's profitable and got decent sort of metrics in terms of its return on capital and operating margins and things like that, um, then, yeah, I could consider it. And Andrew Tolbert asks, what are your views on REITs, real estate investment trusts? Well, you need to be a little bit careful. Obviously, the, the discounts have sort of widened out massively on those, but, you know, the market is a discounting mechanism. And obviously, it's, as we're already seeing, a few announcements have come through where companies are seeing not all of their rent being collected. So you've seen something, well, we've... This quarter end payment date, we've 
we've received 76% or 80% of our expected income. Um, so that's the first thing to watch out for. And, you know, obviously that might bounce back uh, if the economy comes straight back in a V-shaped fashion, but equally if lots of businesses go bust or find that they're challenged, then, you know, that, that rent um, could remain under pressure. And then the other thing to be aware of or wary of with, with REITs is the, um, the gearing. You need to look at the loan to value and covenants and all that sort of stuff because you know if uh if those rents fall away too far too quickly um and the valuations get sort of created perhaps by the valuers once uh the fog clears because at the moment they're all putting um warnings on their valuations so um you know yeah long term they're not a bad place to be but just need to tread a bit carefully at the moment i'd say and um- Ankit Hadini asks, when it comes to the UK market, how do you see it behaving when there's Brexit at the end of the year with this whole coronavirus situation? Um, well, obviously, Brexit is that ongoing unknown uncertainty. But, you know, to a degree, I suppose we've had um, almost a, a well, a, a sort of early run of that in a way. We've had all these problems with supply chains and um, food supplies and fruit and veg not being picked in in the fields because they can't get the workers. So um, is Brexit going to make that worse? I mean, I suppose it, it might do, but, um, you know, it's just another thing we've got to get through, really. Again, perhaps another reason for being, um, you know, a bit more cautious about, oh, it's fine, everything will be back to normal in, in three weeks when we're all let out again. You know, I'm, I'm not so sure. Yeah, we might still be dealing with, you know, social distancing measures, only sort of half half the people can go to the restaurants or whatever and um, will people be so keen to go and book holidays and uh, that if they're not sure if there's going to be another outbreak um, you know I think until there's a vaccine you know discovered and tested and then widely available you know the the risk is that we might see further outbreaks or um, things like that on top of you know Brexit uh, issues along the way so yeah I'm not pretending that it's a it's a great outlook and yeah that's why i'm probably still on the more cautious side of things and not getting carried away with the rally that we've seen and janey anka luffert asks would it be a good idea to start investing in the global bond index i wouldn't say so myself i say i'm an equity man um, so i'm probably not the best person to ask but you know you just look at sort of bond yields and where they've come from and where they've got to um, unless you're thinking that we're going to have a deflationary depression in which case you know fixed income and cash would become more valuable as general prices fell and fell and fell um that's probably the only scenario under which i would um buy bonds myself but you know that's not something that uh, i don't think the governments and central banks are, seem to be doing their utmost to try and avoid that situation but of course they might fail but um so yeah that's the only scenario under which i would buy a global bond fund i mean might be a source of um, you know safety in the short term. It, it could be a tactical trade, but uh, say it's not something I'd want to hold for the long term. And Ben Sharman says, thanks for the presentation. When you're looking at investment trusts for income, is there anything else you consider other than reserves and number of years of dividend increases? He goes on to say, CTY looks good with a 6% plus yield and over 50 years of increases. Uh, absolutely. Well, the things he mentions there are certainly things that I look at, but uh, the other factors to bear in mind or take into account um, that you need to be comfortable with. Obviously, gearing is another feature or you know, the ability to borrow. Um, so that can enhance and also detract from returns for investment trusts. So that's something also to look at and be aware of. Um, and then also the the charges that uh, they levy and you know, how high or low those are. Obviously, that is seen as historically one of the advantages of investment trusts that they tend to be um, lower charging than uh, open ended companies. Although that gap has uh, narrowed somewhat as there's been more fee pressure on the open ended companies uh, in recent years. So, yeah, uh, those would be the main things that you need to sort of satisfy yourself about yes obviously the gearing obviously and then obviously the strategy what what the fund is actually uh, investing in and are you comfortable with the the asset class and uh, and the makeup of the portfolio and neil shaw asks are share buybacks the same as dividends in your opinion um they're not the same i mean it, it's all choice of um use of capital for for a um company now obviously share buybacks 
Um, you know, some people argue that they're they're a good thing and you should take them into account. There are there are theories that you should look at shareholder total return, so you factor in um, dividends and share buybacks, and that has been suggested as a as an even better way maybe of identifying stocks. Um, I mean, the difference between well, historically, the difference between share buybacks and, and dividends was that companies were always very reluctant to cut their dividends and seemed to only do it as a last resort. And although obviously this time around, it's been much quicker and faster that people, because it's such an extreme situation that they've been forced to sort of withdraw dividends or suspend them at least. And some have just had to you know, stop paying them because they're not gonna have the wherewithal to do so. Share buybacks were never quite you know, as um, robust as that. You know, it was something that companies would probably do quite regularly, but then as soon as things cut up rough, they'd, they'd stop doing it. And you know, that wasn't seen as a bad thing necessarily, was they were always fought shy of cutting dividends if they possibly could. Although, as I say, this time around, you know, the, they've been um, a lot quicker to cut and the downside seems to be a lot greater than you would have seen historically. Um, but that's, that's what I'd say on that, really. And just a couple more questions. John Tan says, the market seems overvalued relative to the outlook. Do you think the market's irrational? And if so, why? Well, I wouldn't. I was certainly in the U.S. I, mean, I think you could argue that the valuations were quite high over there, and um, probably still looking relatively full. I think when we looked at the valuations of the U.K. market on the way through, um, I wouldn't describe them as as high. If anything, you know, they're getting down towards you know, good value territory with the the P approaching sort of ten times or or less. Obviously, that will spike up as the downgrades come through. So. Yeah, I wouldn't say the UK, and also, you know, investors have been quick to observe, well, UK is a rubbish market because look how it's underperformed the US for the last 20 years or whatever. Um, although the dividends, once you factor those in, it's not as bad as all that. But, you know, we've essentially gone nowhere in capital terms for, for 20 years. And that that goes back to more um, the valuation at the start of that period in 1999. I would say valuations were irrational back then because, you know, remember very well the dot-com bubble and you know, I was running income portfolios at the time, and it was just nuts. You know, what p- people buying stuff hand over fist that had no revenues, no earnings, nothing, and the you know, the real world economy stocks, you know, just on bargain valuations. You know, but that was irrational, I would say. But today, you know, the the valuations P in dividend yields are pretty recognisable, and you know, there's no no sort of similar dot com thing going on certainly not in the uk obviously us and other places have got all their sort of uh, nifty five or six um, whatever the latest acronym is for them, you know the googles and apples of, of this world but you know they're so you know there the could be an extent to which you know the us markets um, some of those stocks i don't know I'm, I'm not big on the us market or or tech stocks particularly but you know Equally, they seem to have come out pretty well from this this whole crisis. So it might just be that that, that trend carries on and they, they continue sort of uh, mopping up. Certainly Amazon has been a big winner out of it and Netflix is, you know, booming because everyone's sitting at home watching box sets or whatever. Um, but, you know, I'm probably not the person to to pass judgment on those uh, those tech stocks. But as far as the UK goes, my area, you know, I wouldn't say um, valuations are irrational. Uh, if anything, verging on being good value. Thank you very much, Jamie. I think we better leave it there. But before you leave, can you tell listeners where they can find you? Uh, yep. Yeah, um, well, I, I put a website up um, a few years back when I sort of started this to sort of um, detail my process. That's called compoundincome.org. I and mean, if you just stick compound income into a, into a search engine, um, it'll, it'll come up, I'm sure. And I'm on Twitter under the handle Jamie at uh, Compound Income, if people want to follow me there. I do mostly stuff just about sort of investing and uh, related things related to that. So uh, if you're interested in cats doing funny things or something, then I'm yeah, not the person to follow. But if you find out about investing stuff, then you can find me there as well. Great. Well, we'll put a link to your website and your slides underneath the recording of this webinar. So for everyone listening, if you want an email notification of events or webinars we're organising, please 
do the sign up for events on the right hand side of the homepage at PI World. I think there's two boxes, one to subscribe and one to sign up for events. So sign up there and we don't spam anyone. And lastly, please do tell your investing friends about PI World and write comments or like our videos on Twitter and bulletin boards and YouTube. We'd like to go on providing these free webinars and getting good speakers and they rely on getting good audience numbers. So thanks very much for joining us and stay well.